me a salmon pass on. Um, thank you for your presentation, and it's actually very helpful to hear already some of the specific challenges relevant to Romania and some of the recommendations. Um, and I hope that IFAS will be able to give you some examples from different countries of exactly some of the recommendations that you've suggested. Um, it was particularly interesting to me, you made a comment at the end regarding participation and legitimacy. And I think that is a challenge many countries are thinking about now because the level of voter turnout obviously can impact the legitimacy of the mandate that of the representatives that come in. To give you an example, Sri Lanka held an election recently and in some parts of the country, they had only 5% turnout. So there are obviously questions about whether the people who were elected have a legitimate mandate. So I think participation and inclusiveness is essential. <clears throat> I'm going to be very brief because I want to give most of the time to my colleagues who focus on the operational um, aspects that you've touched on. Um, and maybe just briefly, because I didn't introduce myself properly earlier, um, I'm Catherine Eleanor. I'm the Senior Global Legal Advisor at IFAS. So my main area of focus is on legal and constitutional frameworks for elections and then election dispute resolution mechanisms. As Septimius mentions, IFAS has been developing a series of papers on particular types of challenges that the pandemic is presenting. My colleague Stefan will be speaking shortly about the operational challenges and some recommendations for addressing those. <clears throat> the next paper um, coming out will be on the legal and constitutional issues around election postponements and modifications. So I'm going to briefly touch on some of the points from that paper and some comparative examples. Um, so we're obviously looking at the two different elements because a lot of countries we see are responding to the pandemic by postponing elections initially, as Romania is doing and then looking at the types of modifications they may need to do to eventually run elections. We have actually been tracking postponements, and there are, I think, around 58 countries or territories that have postponed their elections already, which is significant if you consider that's around a quarter of the world. So in terms of international principles, Postponements are not necessarily um, against international standards. The International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights, ICCPR, actually provides um, an Article 4 provisions around emergency measures and certain rights um, can be derogated under certain conditions, including um, political and electoral rights. However, they are under very strict lim uh, limitations and they need to be proportional and obviously time bound. So in terms of international principles, postponements um, are potentially legitimate. But we are finding that in terms of national laws and standards, some postponements are presenting challenges in different ways. So to give you an example, one of the first challenges is term limits that might exist in the constitution or the electoral law and countries um, are facing challenges when an election postponement may go beyond the term limit that is set out in the constitution or the legal framework. Um, as an example right now Ethiopia is facing this challenge with postponed elections and right now a constitutional inquiry is having to examine whether the postponement is legitimate given the term limits that exist in the constitution. Another challenge is the timing of the postponement. There are a number of countries who had already begun the electoral process 
and then had to postpone in the middle of it. So one example is local elections in Spain, where they were already partway through the process, and they initially postponed the elections, but then they found that there was no legal basis for this and ended up cancelling the elections, meaning that they would have to restart the process from voter registration, particularly to ensure that they could enfranchise um, newly eligible voters who had become eligible during the time of the postponement. Many countries are having challenges around basically silence in the laws between how to deal with emergency powers on one hand and electoral laws on the other. And then the last challenge that is coming up in some countries is who decides on a postponement? Is it the electoral authority? Is it parliament? Is it executive? And a number of countries, including in Europe, are facing challenges as they are already under a caretaker government with their parliament dissolved. So there are a lot of legal complexities arising. Clearly, transparency and consultation is fundamental to trying and tr to address some of these challenges, as Septimius has already said. So that is around election postponements. The next challenge as countries move from reacting to the pandemic to responding and thinking about running elections is around modifications to how the electoral process is run. And Septimius has already made some suggestions about modifications that could take place. And I think one of the comments that you made, Septimius, was important, that there is a difference between changing the entire system of voting and introducing modifications to parts of the process. And obviously changes to the entire voting system can be very significant. They can impact voter rights and often they need testing, consultation and careful introduction. Whereas modifications may be easier to do, particularly in a crisis. I just wanna make the point that legal or procedural amendments during a crisis present both risks and opportunities. And I think it's important to acknowledge the risks, particularly around the potential for either deliberate or inadvertent manipulation of the rules around elections. Obviously in an emergency situation, there are governments are wielding significant amounts of power and it is important to make sure that that is not used to impact some of those fundamental principles that Sipsumius mentioned, such as fairness, competitiveness, secrecy, and inclusiveness. So those are the risks. There are opportunities. And again, Sipsumius touched on them. Countries are considering a number of different types of measures to avoid crowded polling stations. So for example, expanded postal voting, um, expanded um, advanced voting, or other types of um, special measures. Now these may be actually beneficial for certain types of vulnerable groups, such as persons with disabilities, as Septimius mentioned. So the opportunity might be if we are introducing these special measures now in a crisis, can we make sure that these measures are preserved in the longer term um, to enfranchise vulnerable groups? Just a few more points. Um, I won't repeat some of what Septimia said, simply to reinforce that the principles of stability, legal certainty, clarity of the law, and inclusiveness are fundamental. I'm sure all of you have been following the situation in Poland 
um, where they are introducing an entire new system of postal voting, and they were doing so immediately before the election. And obviously, that impacts a lot of those principles we just talked about and can certainly undermine trust in the electoral authority, the process, and the outcome of the election longer term. When considering different types of modifications, again, it's important to look at where the rules currently sit, whether it is in the constitution, the legislation, or in the regulations and procedures of the electoral authority. And ideally, there is enough flexibility in the legislation and enough authority in the electoral commission to be able to make modifications administratively. So you will have all seen that South Korea recently held um, parliamentary elections. And a lot of the measures that they put in place, they were able to do so very quickly because they had existing rules in the legislation that they could just extend um, as special measures. So for example, there were provisions for early voting that they could extend to greater swaths of voters. There were provisions for postal voting and what they did was extend those to certain categories of voters, particularly those people who were quarantined at home or were in the hospital as a result of the pandemic. And then the last point perhaps I will just touch on is, and I think again, Septimius already talked about it, modifications are going to be needed, not just around election day, but to the different parts of the process. And I know the Romanian Permanent Electoral Authority is already aware of this and has already started putting in place measures to respond, for example, around the number of signatures needed to be um, collected and receiving campaign finance reports electronically. Um, obviously, there may be things around voter registration there may be issues around campaigning. For example, in Lithuania, the campaign period started in April, but now the election has been postponed. But there is no legal way to pause the campaign period. And there is a fear that this is going to benefit the incumbent government through the use of government resources. Um, but as the electoral authorities think through the different operational changes that are needed in parts of the process. It will obviously be important to think through whether there are legal legislative changes or regulatory administrative changes that need to be made at the same time to preserve that legal certainty and then to communicate those changes to stakeholders.